this opportunity, take this time to worship, to honor, to love Him, to glorify Him. Thank you, Jesus, for being in our hearts, for being in our soul, in our minds, and in our spirit. Lord, we may align with you and do your will. We love you so much, Lord Jesus.
Jesus is mine, 
Thank you, team. You can be seated. I want to explain something. What the Lord is showing me. Father, help me to put this into plain English, and that your people may understand. That it will have clarity of this revelation. Bless us in this, Lord. Every time the Lord show me something, I ask the Lord for a word in the scriptures to confirm what He is saying. It's not my imagination, but it is His word. Because every time the Lord gives us visions or the Lord speaks to us, there is the word that will confirm it. Matthew chapter 13. I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures today, by the grace of God. Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 onwards. Let's go there quickly. Let me read to you first, so that you can understand what I'm going to share to you. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 24 onwards. And I'm going to read to you. Another parable he put forth to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Now very quickly, in the New Testament, Jesus spoke about 40 parables, and all these 40 parables speaks about the kingdom of God. There are 40 parables in the New Testament. All of them pertain to the kingdom of God. And that's why the church today is about the kingdom. It's about the king. So he says that there is a kingdom, the parable here is the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while man slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. And so the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, First, gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. This was what I saw in the Spirit just now. Remember I spoken about the 12th category of things which must happen before Jesus comes back again in our Elijah Academy. And the Lord showed me this, and I told you in those teachings that one of the things which must happen is the abound of lawlessness, the abound of evil, the abound of all kinds of perversion and distortion of law and nature. And you can see that today all over the world. Same-sex marriage is one of them. And there are all kinds of distorted and perverted practices that man 
are indulging in in these last days these are the signs jesus says that lawlessness will abound before he comes back now just now in the vision i saw and i pray that you understand this i saw that there is a shift in the ground a shift okay that's happening and shifting means transition. It means that something new are, are happening. And this has already happened. But it is now, here it is, it is now being culminated. It is now being accelerated. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to express itself in greater measure, in fuller measure in these coming days. And one of the things that I saw in the Spirit just now, was tares going uh, growing up alongside wheat what are the wheat the wheat are the produce of good seed you, you hear me the wheat are what we have sown these are the good works of the kingdom these are genuine authentic kingdom ministries these are the authentic preaching of the word these are everything that the Holy Spirit is doing on earth through the body of Christ. This is the wheat that is sprouting up in the earth. But alongside the wheat, we are seeing tares. Now, if you, if you will understand this, the tares, the tares look exactly like the wheat. In fact, if you would just look at them from a distance they have the same texture the same color they have even they, they grow even in the same density or height they look exactly the same what differentiate the tares and the wheat is the substance of the grain head are you getting this the wheat has grain head. It has substance. What is the substance? The substance is the root of the Holy Ghost working to that ministry. The substance is the substance of the person of Jesus Christ in that kingdom ministry, in the preaching of the word, in the fruits that are sprouting up, that Jesus is the source of that. That's the grain head. That's the substance of the wheat. But the tares do not have the substance. I pray that the Lord will give you understanding today because we're going to go very deep in the Word. The tares have no substance. It looks, it looks like Christianity. It looks like Jesus, but it's a counterfeit. Are you getting this? It's a counterfeit. It is... It is built on man's ambition. It is built on a man's vision. It is built on a counterfeit gospel, a watered-down gospel, a gospel that does not live up to the plumb line of God's standard and His Word. And there are a lot of these kind of false teaching, false teachers that is, hear this, that is spread all over the nations today. Hear these people of God. The devil knows how to use nice, fancy names. All right? Everything that has the name kingdom attached to it doesn't mean it has the kingdom in it. Don't be deceived. Oh, this one kingdom, that one kingdom. Make sure the kingdom is there. <laughs> All right? Not everything that has the kingdom attached to it has the kingdom in it. All right? And, and so this is happening today. In fact, this is, this is the release of the first apocalyptic horse, the white horse of deception, where that person that rides on the first horse in Revelation chapter 6, that is not Jesus. That is the false Christ, all right? And what was he shooting? He has a bow and arrow too, remember? Revelation chapter 6, the first horse, the white horse, okay? That is not Christ, all right? These are apocalyptic horses of destruction, catastrophes, and deceptions, okay? Now, the first horse, <laughs> we are seeing that happening now all over the world, all over the nations, especially in what we call Christendom, the body of Christ. 
I saw just now tares growing alongside, and they are so closely knitted to the wheat. The deception are so closely intertwined with the authentic that when the reaper says, should we pull out, should we pull out the tares? And the Lord here, or the master of the field here, say, you cannot pull it out. You may even destroy what is, what is genuine, what is authentic. It means that they are so closely knitted, they have in a way infiltrated the body of Christ today. John MacArthur, the one who wrote one of, he, he was one of the, the editors of the uh, MacArthur, John MacArthur Leadership Bible. Uh, John MacArthur wrote a beautiful book called Snakes in the Pulpit. And you have to understand that this is happening today. The enemy, the enemy main target of attack is the body of Christ. All right? Because that is where he divides us. That's where he brings conflict. That's where he brings internal civil wars and offenses in the body of Christ to split the church. Are you hearing this? <laughs> and so this is what's happening today in the body of Christ. The wheat and the tares are growing up. And that's why this is eschatological. This is an end time message because in verse 30 of Matthew chapter 13, it says, Let them grow together until the harvest, and at the time of the harvest, what is the harvest? That's a rapture. And Jesus will say to the reapers, who are the reapers? The angels. This is parallel to Revelation chapter 14. All right? And then it says, Gather together those who are the tares. Bind them throw them, burn them, and gather the wheat, the one that is authentic, the one that is genuine, the one that has the grain head, the substance, and gather them into my kingdom, into the barn. And this is happening today in the body of Christ. And I saw just now that there is a shift. Uh, there is a shift happening in the nations today. And in this shifting... Shiftings are transitions, okay? There is both extremes happening at the same time. On one side, you will see the extremities of kingdom movement, or should I say, the intensity, I won't use the word extremity, forgive me, Lord, the intensity of kingdom movement, authentic, genuine kingdom movement sprouting up over the nations of the world. The wheat are growing everywhere. But as God is moving, so is the devil moving on the other side of the extreme. Are you getting this? It means that as we see a greater house, as we see a greater awakening to the body of Christ, to their kingdom calling, to the kingdom mandate, there will also be greater deception and lawlessness happening, especially in the body of Christ. The wheat and the tares grow at the same time. The more the wheat grow, the more the tares grow. And they, 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 in a way, they even intermingle themselves to the point that you cannot separate them until the time of the harvest. So this is what's happening in the body of Christ today. The second thing that I saw on this side of what the kingdom of God is doing, or what God is doing in the kingdom, all right, but what the Holy Spirit is doing. Give me one minute. A word is coming. This is beautiful, I love it when the Lord interrupts me. <sighs> He's the king, you know. He has every right to interrupt us. <laughs> he, lo he knows that I love fancy words. He just said,
thank you, Lord. I'll come back to what I'm saying just now, but let, let God be God and let Him say what He wants to say first. Given us the word, now explain this, Lord. The Lord just said this to me, and this is this is to bless your heart. What we are doing is we are cultivating moments. You know that song. In moments like this, we are cultivating moments with the Lord, moments in His presence, moments with the Holy Spirit, a moment in His heartbeat, hearing His heartbeat, hearing His heart, His voice, His purpose, His will for you and I, for Malaysia, for the nations, for His kingdom purpose. This is what I call moments. And what we are doing is going to gain momentum. Moments when you... Oh, Lord, help me the words here. When you pursue those moments or when you inject your time your energy, your passion, and your purpose into those moments, those moments start to gain momentum. All right? And momentum will accumulate, and in that momentum, it becomes a message. What is that message? The message is always about the king and his kingdom. Acts chapter 1, I believe, is in verse 3. Just as it is in the book of Acts, so shall it be in these last days before the Lord come back for His church. Oh, Mashedo Ramonza. Yes, verse 3. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. God. See the word there? Before Jesus ascended, after his resurrection, he was walking the earth for 40 days. The Bible recorded five instances where he appeared to his followers, all right? It could be more than five, but five were stated in the word. And in those 40 days, Jesus was teaching them. What was he teaching? The kingdom of God. He was talking about things pertaining to to the kingdom of God. So shall it be in these days before Jesus come back again for His church. The church will again rise up to a kingdom identity and a kingdom mandate. And the church, the body of Christ, have to be talking about the kingdom. And the kingdom is always about the king and his domain and his administration and his agendas and his priorities. And that's the reason why we have to understand that the message that the Lord is giving to the church today, the message the Lord is giving to the body of Christ today, is not about the church, this church, that church. It's all about King Jesus. It's all about the kingdom. It's all about the government of the king. And as you talk about the kingdom, God will demonstrate the kingdom on earth. The momentum will become the message, and the message is about the king and his kingdom. 
And then the message will become a movement. And this is a global movement that the Holy Spirit is doing here on earth in these days. And that movement will become a mission for the body of Christ. That will be our core value, our core virtue. That is the mission to accomplish God's kingdom. The mission to administer and to establish and to expand and to enlarge God's kingdom on earth. And all this will lead to the millennium reign of Christ. Are you, are you getting that? Thank you for that, Lord. And so that was what I was saying earlier on, that these wheat are growing up. The kingdom agenda of God is expanding, enlarging, and establishing itself in many places in the nations of the world today. And this is the last day move of the Holy Spirit. And Christians and churches need to have their eyes awakened, need to have the eyes of their heart open to understand. That's the reason why in that day, when Jesus says the parable about the ten virgins, when He come back, there will be a part of the body of Christ that have the oil burning in their lampstand. Oh, that is a kingdom mandate because they are looking, they are waiting, they are pursuing, and they are anticipating the King and His kingdom, and they are burning with oil in their lampstand. Stands. But there's also a portion of the body of Christ that does not have that vision and therefore there's no fire in the Lamb. Are you hearing all this? So people of God, we are in that time. Another word is coming. Psalms 1, 4, 5, verse 11, verse 12. The Lord is saying this to us and especially to this generation. I want this young generation to hear this word. You are going to speak about the power of God's kingdom. They shall speak of the glory of what? The kingdom. The glory of your kingdom. They will talk of His power, this young generation. They will talk of His power. And you cannot talk of God's power unless you experience that power and that power become your testimony. Hello? The, the messenger must become the message. And the message becomes the messenger. Otherwise, there is no power in the message. So if you're going to talk about the glory, you're going to talk about the power, it means you're going to experience the glory and the power of God's kingdom. And verse 12 tells us this. Oh, I like this one. <laughs> and you will make known to the sons of man His mighty acts. Mighty acts means what? God's demonst demonstration. God's powerful administration and action in the nations. You will talk about it. And you will talk about the glorious majesty of what? His kingdom. You see that? This is, this is what the Holy Spirit is breathing into, what He is fanning, what He is moving, and we are in that movement. Are you guys alive? We are in that movement because in moments like this, these moments that we are having are gaining momentum. They are gaining momentum. Every time when there are two or three who gather, hear this, when there are two or three who gather, We know this word very well, you know, 2 Corinthians 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways, seek my face and pray and repent, I will heal their land. We know this word. The Lord said, if my people... I asked the Lord this, Lord, where are your people? The Lord says, I don't need many. If even there's only two or three. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If there's only two, because when two or three agree, it is done. Hello. 
Jesus says, when two or three are gathered, I'm in the midst of them. Hallelujah. And now we have more than two or three here, right? And when you are building moments like these, they are gaining momentum, and that momentum will become the message of the king, the message of his kingdom, and they are going to, they are going to break out into movement. They will become the global mission of the body of Christ that will lead to the millennium. This is what the Lord just downloaded to us just now. I give you glory, Lord. I give you glory. Wonderful Jesus. <sighs> Second Peter chapter one. Verse 19. You have the prophetic word. The Lord is saying to you, these words will be confirmed. And He say, you do well, you do well, if you heed, receive, and pray and walk and run with the prophetic word. You do well. Because when you run with the word, that word becomes a light in you. And that word gives you hope. That word gives you anticipation and expectation. And that word will shine in a dark place. And then it says here, until the day dawns. So, before dawn, there is always a period of darkness. Are you getting this? Before the sun rises, we have to go through a few hours of extreme darkness. Again, the wheat and the tares. And then it says, until the day dawns and the morning star, who is the morning star? Jesus. And the morning star. Can I tell you quickly, Satan is not the morning star. He is called son of the morning star. You hear what I just say? Don't confuse Satan as the morning star, all right? He is called son of the morning star. <laughs> <laughs> when he was Lucifer, the light bearer, before he fall, all right? So, we do well when we heed the prophetic word. They are our life, they are our expectation, they are what we anticipate. And like what I'm saying to you just now, we are in the time of shifting. I've spoken this to you and I want to say this again. We are in the transition from goodness, grace and goodness into government and greatness and into global and glory. We are in that transition, people of God. The church is going through a transition and that transition has somehow speed up, all right? It has accelerated ever since Israel became 70 years old last year. Are you getting this? So church, it is time for us to wake up. It is time for us to have our eyes open. Oh, I like this one. People of God, every time the children of Israel march when they were in the wilderness, every time they came, and then the glory of God would move the pillar of light and the pillar of cloud would move and they would follow the pillar of light, pillar of cloud. Every time when they start to move, when they start to march, the three tribes will always lead the way. What are the three tribes? The tribe of Judah, the tribes of Issachar, the tribes of Zebulun. What are these three tribes? Judah, 
praises, when we keep on praising the Lord, when we keep on worshipping the Lord, when we keep on proclaiming our thanksgiving, our gratitude unto Him, then we will also have Issachar anointing. What is the Issachar anointing? Issachar discerned the time and season and Israel was saved. The Issachar anointing is very important for the body of Christ today. And that's why God is again emphasizing the maturity of the prophetic movement in these last days because we need the Issachar anointing to direct the church in what God is doing, what the Holy Spirit is saying. All right? And then you have the Zebulun. What are the Zebulun tribe? They are the armor bearers. They are the ones who carry the weapons. You need these people of God. We need praises. We need understanding, discernment, and revelation. And we need our weapons of warfare to march toward our destiny in these last days. Are you getting all this? Wonderful Jesus, I give you glory. Now, I want to talk about something where the Lord has uh, put in my heart earlier on in the evening just now. And uh, we thank you for this, Lord. Thank you for all these M's. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, yesterday, yesterday, uh, I was talking about the arrow. And I show you from Isaiah 49, verse 2, that we are called to be a polished shaft in the quiver of God. So we are called to be arrows. We must have a polished shaft, all right? We thank God that the Lord show us also in Psalms 45 and verse 5 where it says that the arrows are sharp. The arrows of the Lord, they are sharp in the enemy of the king or in the king's or the heart of the king enemies, okay, to, to be exact. So, people of God, we are called to be arrows of the Lord. Yesterday, I showed you that we need to have arrowhead that is sharp. That's the gifts. This is the external. This is the manifestation. This is what we see externally, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We need to have the shaft. This is what we call the internal part, the soul part, the character, the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And we need to have the Holy Spirit guidance, being led by the Holy Spirit. Romans 8.14. You can also add on. Thank you, Lord, for that. Proverbs, Proverbs 21, verse 1. The king's heart is in the hand of of the Lord, like rivers, he turns it whichever way he wishes. If you have surrendered your heart in the Lord's hand, he can turn you whichever way he wishes. Proverbs 21 1. The king's heart. Who are the king here? We are all kings and priests of the Most High God. Tomorrow, I, I felt this very strongly that the Lord wants me to talk about how our identity will prevail in the fire, in the trials of fire in the coming days, that we can shine brightly for Jesus, that we can prevail in who God called us to be. That's for tomorrow. Hallelujah. But, oh, Hallelujah. Oh, I give you glory, I give you praise. I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to him. Hallelujah. Wonderful Lord. I thank you, Father. I give you praise, I give you glory. Many of you, many of you are coming out of your shell. You didn't know you have a shell. And many of you are coming out of the shell of confinement, the shell of limitation. You see, that, that butterfly was a lava, a worm in a cocoon. And when it breaks out, it becomes a beautiful butterfly. That is what we call metamorphosis, 
a complete transformation. And the Lord just say that to you. Many of you, <laughs> you are in that transition. You are progressing to possess what God has for you. And you are going through that process. Hallelujah. And you are going to break out of the shell of confinement and limitation and walk into your kingdom identity and your kingdom authority that will propel you to your kingdom destiny. I give you glory, Lord. So, Proverbs 21, 1. <laughs> we are to be led by the Holy Spirit to be... To be here it is surrender to be completely submitted to the Lord and let the Lord lead us and guide us like a river. You, ne you can never dictate where a river flows, you know. Hallelujah. Oh, i got so much to share here, Lord. John chapter 3, verse 8. You do not know where the wind comes from, where the wind goes. So are everyone that is born of the Spirit. You are being led by the wind. You are being led by the river. You are being led by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And this is your character. This is also Ephesians and chapter 5 and verse 9, where it says this is the fruit of the Spirit. This is righteousness. This is your truth. This is, this is the fruit of goodness. Hallelujah. Oh, wonderful Jesus. Korashanta, Rabata, Kihansa. This is Psalms, uh, Psalms uh, uh, 45 and verse 3, where it speaks about truth, humility, and righteousness. This is all about the character. I told you that you cannot have crooked shaft, right? If you have a crooked shaft, people of God, if you have a crooked shaft, that arrow cannot hit the mark, remember? So we must have good character. We must have a good character to bear the weight of the gifts because the gifts are heavy. They are glorious. They are kabod gifts of God. Hallelujah. So you must have a sharp that is straight and you must have a sharp arrowhead which speaks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Yesterday I talked to you about what is the purpose of the arrow? Number one, in the context, you are the arrows in the hands of the Lord. Second thing, your arrows are also your weapons of warfare. Your arrows, hear this, can reach where the sword cannot reach. Hello? Sword is for daily battles against all kinds of challenges, giants that you face, resistance, oppression, whatever demonic attack. You use the sword of the Spirit, the word and prayer. That's your sword. Arrows are to pull down demonic strongholds in the second heavens because arrows can reach where your sword cannot reach. Can I show you the word? 2 Kings chapter 13. Everything that the Lord says to us, the Word confirms it. Amen? This is the Word of God. This is not my Word. Second Kings, uh, let me go there. Chapter 13. And let's see here, people of God. Oh, this is beautiful. Let's start from verse 14. I, I want to expound on this passage for your understanding to bless you because you are so good and you all look so serious. Hallelujah. 2 Kings 13, verse 14. Elisha had become sick with the illness of which he would die. Sometimes, people of God, please understand this. Men and women of God can become sick. No need to explain why. Because we live in a human body. Billy Graham was in a wheelchair before he passed away. All right? Men and women of God, no matter how anointed you are, you can still become sick. In fact, that can be also one of the means which God used to bring you home. He's saying to you, your time is up. So for me to bring you home, 
so something will happen to your physical body, you fall sick or something, and so bye-bye. Bye-bye is not the end of everything. Bye-bye is graduation. It's the beginning of all things. Okay? Hallelujah. So, Elisha was sick. And Joash, now please do not confuse this Joash with the king of Judah, that Joash who became king at the age of eight years old. That was a good king. This Joash did evil in the sight of the Lord. All right? If you would read the, the genealogies of the kings of the northern kingdom and the kings of Judah, you will see that all the kings of the northern kingdom, all of them did evil in the sight of the Lord. Can I bless you quickly with this? Why is it that the genealogy, the generations of the kings in the northern kingdom, why is it that all of them fail? Why is it that all of them did evil in the eyes of God? Because of generational curses. Because of generational sin that's been passed on. The northern kingdom, hear this, started from the sons of who? Solomon, right? He had two sons. And Rehoboam went to the north, sorry, from the sons of David. Rehoboam went to the north and started the northern kingdom. And later on, there's another king called Jeroboam. If you would read in the Old Testament, the name Jeroboam appeared almost 40 times. Every time God said he remembered the sins of Jeroboam. What did Jeroboam do? He erected a statue, a false statue of idolatry in Samaria and he said that people don't have to go to Jerusalem to worship Yahweh, they can worship God in Samaria and that is idolatry to God. Okay, so God remembered the sins of Jeroboam because of the sins of idolatry is being passed on to the third and fourth generation and it continued and continued. Okay, so Joash here is one of those generations. Now he came, he came, <laughs> the king of Israel came to Elisha. Elisha was about to go back to heaven or in that time was about to go to paradise. Because in Old Testament, when they die, they don't go to heaven, they go to paradise. Okay? You got to understand that. It's only when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, it's the tombs, the tombs in Jerusalem were open. Remember that scripture? The tombs were open. Hallelujah. And the saints of Old Testament time came out from the graves during the resurrection of Jesus. Okay, that's in Matthew 27. Now let's come to this. So, Joash came to Elisha and he said, Oh my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. Who said this word before? Elisha himself. When did he say these words? When? Elijah was taken up to heaven. Remember? That's in 2 Kings chapter 2. All right? And so when Elijah rose up to heaven, the chariot came and took him up. Elijah who was a very young man at that time. He saw Elijah going up in the chariot. And what did he say? My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. Now, some historians and also a very profound, a prominent Jewish rabbi said this. He said that this is a term. My father, my father, and then he said, the chariots of Israel. He said that this is a military term that is used to describe the highest commander in the Israelite army. And if that is true, it means that the prophet Elijah carries the same authority as the highest commander in the Israelite army. All right? If that is true, okay? But let's come back to this. So when Elijah was taken up, Elisha was the one who said, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen. 
and this word has spread. It has spread all over the, the region. People know about that story. They don't have CNN, they don't have TV Tiga, but by word of mouth, the story of Elijah rising up and what did Elisha say, what took place, that story become a common story known by everyone. And that's why even the king knew that. That's why now the king, he knew that Elisha is about to say bye-bye. So he came, to, he came to Elisha and he tried to re hear this. He tries to reenact again the same situation. Now, what happened? What happened when Elijah was taken up to heaven? What happened when Elijah was taken up to heaven? He gave his what? His mantle. All right? He gave his office. He gave his anointing. He gave his commission to Elisha. And now Joash knew that Elisha is about to say bye-bye. So he tried to get that mantle. He tried to get that anointing. He tried to get that commission from Elisha. So he tried the same trick again. My father, my father, chariots of Israel and their horsemen. Did Elisha give, give the mantle to Joash? No, he did not. In fact, Elisha died and was buried with that mantle on him. That's the reason why, that's the reason why in verse 21, let's go there quickly. That's the reason why in verse 21, so it was as they were burying a man that suddenly, they was burying a dead man here, all right, that suddenly they spread, they spied, sorry, a band of raiders and they put the man in the tomb of Elisha. And when the, the man, the dead man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. That was why when they put a dead man, a dead soldier, into the same tomb as Elisha, that dead man was raised from the dead. Some people say, oh, Elisha died, the bones still anointed. It's not the bones being anointed, it's the mantle that is still upon him. Do you understand? That mantle that was on him raised a dead body. So, where is that mantle now? God is giving that mantle to the church, the last day church, the mantle of Elijah. That's why in Malachi 4 verse 5, in that day, I will send you the prophet Elijah. That's why Luke 1.17 says that it's not the person, it's the spirit and power of Elijah that was given to John the Baptist. Who is John the Baptist? The one that prepares the way for the first coming of Jesus ministry who is the john john the baptist today the last day church that prepares the way for the coming messiah again that mantle the spirit and power of elijah is upon us okay now let me continue with the story here so verse 15 elijah said to him verse 15 take a bow and some arrows. So he took himself a bow and some arrows. See that? And verse 16, And he said to the king of Israel, to Joash here, Put your hand on the bow. So he put his hand on it. And Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. And he said, Open the east window. I heard a commentary who said the reason why it is the east window is because 
God is shooting down all the strongholds in all the eastern nation and the eastern nation will have revival. Don't amen first. There is no basis for that commentary, all right? Hallelujah. That is man's commentary. It has nothing to do with the east window here. The east window, it happened to be the east window because the east window of the king's palace faces Syria. Are you getting that? The enemy is, was coming from the land of Syria, the land of Edom. That's why it faces the east. It's nothing to do with end-time revival in the eastern nations, okay? Don't, don't misinterpret the word. Now, let's come back to this. <laughs> Open the east window, and he opened it, and then Elisha said, shoot, see that? Shoot, and he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from where? Syria. For you must strike the Syrians at a place called Apek till you have destroyed them. So, what did I say to you yesterday? The arrow pulls down demonic strongholds in the spiritual realm. Did the king shoot any enemy there? No. It was a prophetic act. All right? It was a prophetic act of releasing an arrow against the Syrian or the Assyrian's army. And when he did that, what did Elisha say? This is the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. This is your deliverance. This is the arrow that will strike your enemy. Do you see that? So, at that time, Israel, they faced a literal army, the Assyrians. But remember that behind the literal physical army, there's a spiritual army. What? Why, why is it that even from biblical times until today that all this army of nations wants to destroy Israel? Why? Why is it that even today you can look at Lebanon, look at Syria, look at Iran, look at some other nation, they want to destroy Israel? Because there is a spiritual principality, there is a, there is a, there, there is a, a, a devil that wants to destroy Israel because Israel reminds him of his doom. God's end time agenda is going to be centered around Israel and in Jerusalem. So if the devil can wipe out, annihilate the nation of Israel today, then he don't have to worry about the book of Revelation anymore. Are you getting this? Okay? So we have to understand that even from biblical time, Satan knew that Israel is a threat. So he wants to wipe out Israel, even so today, right? Now, that arrow was being released. It flies out from the eastern window. Perhaps it flies about 200 yards, 300 yards in the air and then it went down and it hit somebody's mango tree. It didn't hit anyone at all, right? But what, what did Elisha say? That is the Lord's deliverance. So people of God, do not be ignorant about prophetic acts. When the Holy Spirit stirs you to do prophetic acts, they are powerful. They carry great spiritual significance. Alright? But make sure you are being what? Led by the Spirit. Hallelujah. If it is man's spirit, you can do all kinds of acts, you end up in Hollywood. Hallelujah. Praise God. Wonderful Jesus. Now, after this, in verse 18, and now he said again, <sighs> The Lord wants me to say something first here. Verse 16 again, before we go to verse 18.
put your hand on the bow, King Joash, and then after that, Elisha, Elisha, oh dear Lord, hallelujah. Samuel, quickly come. face the camera okay all right now make an action like you're gonna shoot wow wow this one can shoot very far <laughs> hallelujah okay keep on shoot that's king joash right now old man elisha comes and he put his hands on the king's hands. If Elisha didn't put his hand, can Joash shoot the arrow on his own? Yes, he could. Joash was a strong man. He could handle the bow and arrow, right? Why did Elisha come and put his hand? They are not doing... The Target practice, you know. That arrow just released out the window only. Anywhere it can shoot, anywhere, it doesn't matter. It's not about where it's going to hit, it's about the act, alright? So why did Elisha come and put his hand? The anointing, alright? People of God, when we release, you can stand there. <laughs> alright, you can go back, brother. <laughs> When we, when we decree prophetic acts or when we do prophetic acts, I like say it must be led by the Holy Spirit, it must also be anointed by the Holy Spirit. That's why Elisha placed the anointing, okay? I have heard another commentary will say, oh, Elisha come to mentor him, come to guide him, lead him. Now, he's not doing target practice. You don't need someone to come and lead you and guide you or mentor you. It's not about that. It's about the authority that endorses your prophetic act. Do you hear what I say? You need to have a prophetic authority that will endorse your prophetic act and what you do will see results. That's why it is important that we understand the anointing and the authority that God gives in that anointing. And when we do that, well, we act into that, we run with that, we activate that, we see results. Okay? Now, verse 18. And in verse 18, huh, now, after he has Release that arrow. Now, Elisha asked him, Hey, strike the ground. Strike the ground, you know. <laughs> arrows, people of God, arrows are supposed to be released in the air, not to strike the ground one, right? Now, sometimes you need to understand these people of God. Sometimes radical obedience releases supernatural activation that brings about God's provision or God's deliverance. Okay? So, sometimes it is okay to ask your mind to take a rest and activate your faith to obey God in radical things. Radical obedience always releases supernatural promises or supernatural results and activation in our life. So he took that arrow and this is where Joash fell. Hello. He struck the ground and he struck three times. Okay, this is the arrow. It's not the ground. 
And he looked at himself. He looked at Elisha. He did it again. No one is looking. Okay, some more. <laughs> Arrowhead also broke. And he stopped. He said, this doesn't make sense at all. So, he stopped. He hesitated. Do you get my word? He hesitated. Now look at verse 19. And now verse 19, Elisha, Elisha said to him, verse 19, Elisha became angry. He said, you should have struck five or six times and struck it with desperation. Oh yeah. Struck it with desperation that you would have struck Syria till you have destroyed it. But now you only strike Syria only three times. What do we learn from this principle? People of God, you want to see prophetic fulfillment. You want to see God's promises in your life. You want to see results. You want to see the supernatural. You want to see miracles. Lesson number one, be desperate. If you do something, hesitate, don't make sense. Pray one month, no result. Pray two months, no result. Pastor say fast 33 days. 33 days, no result. Then you give up. Hello. Be desperate. How much do you want to see the promises of God in your life? That will show in your action. You would have struck the ground five times, six times, seven times. You would have struck until that arrow was broken. You would want to see result. You would have the hunger. You would have the desperation and the passion. And you would have the zeal. All this, Joash lack. Do you know? Huh. Now you know. If he would have struck that ground continuously, again and again, if he had shown his desperation, if he had shown his zeal, his passion, that day, Elisha would have given him the mantle. Oh. That day, Elisha would have given him because he's now, he said, I found a king that is passionate, a king that is hungry, that is, de that is des desperate, that is zealous to see God's fulfillment, God's promises. Now, you can steward that mantle. But Joash failed. And we thank God that he failed. Because that mantle awaits you and I today. It is for the church today. Hallelujah. So, people of God, another lesson that we learn here is what? Prophetic acts, when it is endorsed with spiritual authority under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, it carries great and significant results. And be desperate to see that. Be desperate, be zealous about what you are praying for. Keep on pushing, keep on pressing, keep on pursuing, and you're going to see His promises in your life. So, for you and I to function in the gifts, to be effective in the gift, to be an effective arrowhead, or to use the arrows of prophetic, because arrows are prophetic declaration, okay? That pulls down strongholds in the spiritual realm. For you and I to be effective in this, we must be desperate. We must be zealous. We must be passionate. We must be hungry. We must be a people that keep on pursuing, keep on pressing, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. It's okay. Even if you knock down the door of heaven, he wouldn't mind. In fact, he wants you to knock down his door. 
I give you glory. Now, I'm going to go to another direction here. Second Kings and chapter 6. Since we are in Second Kings, let's go to chapter 6. Oh, we bless you, Lord. And starting from verse 1. And the sons of the prophet say to Elisha, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a beam from there and let us make there a place where we may dwell. So he answered, Go, O oh Lord. <laughs> you see the joy and the beauty of ministering in the Word of God under the illumination of the Holy Spirit? Because the moment I spoke this, he gave me another revelation. All glory to you, Lord. Verse 1. How are we going to finish this tonight, Lord? Verse 1. You know, people of God, I cannot understand. I cannot understand. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but I cannot understand how people can read the Bible in one year. You know, you have the one year Bible reading plan, you know. Oh, so this day you cover this chapter, this book. One year you finish all the six books. I cannot understand that. No doubt I have read the Bible from cover to cover 20 over times. All glory to God. But I cannot understand how you can do that in one year. Because when I go into a chapter, sometimes that chapter takes me three hours. Why? That's revelation. There's so much revelation in the Word of God. Even verse 1 itself, there's revelation. The sons of Proverbs came to Elisha and said, See now, the place where we dwell with us is too small. What is the revelation here? Your prophetic gift will always outgrow you. You didn't hear me. <laughs> Let me try on this side. Your prophetic gifts will always outgrow you. <laughs> Hey, the gifts of the Holy Ghost cannot be confined in a small, little confinement. It always outgrows the confinement. It always outgrows the boundary. That's why the sons of the prophets now, they came to Elisha and they say, see, we, we, cannot, we cannot remain here. Our gifting is outgrowing us. We are, hear this, we are going beyond our boundaries. There is so much more that God has for us. We need to have bigger, larger, wider boundaries. I'm talking about the spiritual. Of course, here in the context, it's talking about the physical. <laughs> All right? <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, Lord. What do I mean by this? When you are, when you are empowered by the Lord, anointed by the Lord, and you walk you walk in close relationship with the Holy Spirit. Your fears of authority, your scope of influences grows. And that's why I have the audacity and the bonus and the courage to stand here before you and tell you God wants us to ask Him for Asia. Not just Penang, not just Malaysia. God is too big for that. Your prophetic gift will always outgrow you. Hello. Oh, praise God. And so now, Lord, can we finish this? And so now they came to Elisha and they say, Hey, we, 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 we need to find a bigger place. We need, we need to grow in alignment, in accordance to our call and to our gift and to the anointing that is increasing in our life. That's why, that's why we can trust God for Asia. And so after that, in verse 2, 
Say, please let us go to Jordan. <laughs> let every man take a beam from there and let us make there a place where we may dwell. And so he answered, he said, go. Hallelujah. Something is coming again. If you would read where the sons of this prophet, there's a school of prophets in those days. And Elijah was, in a way, their, you know, their, their leader, right? When Elijah was taken up, the mantle was passed to Elisha. So Elisha, in a way, became the, the leader of these prophets, okay? And you will see that these prophets, they, they were built their dwelling in a place called Bethel. And now they build a place in Jordan. Why is it that they only choose certain places to build their dwelling? Or in Jericho as well. There's another one in Jericho. Why? Because these are places that has open heavens, portals. Because hundreds of years prior to this day, know the story, they know the history. At battle, who had an experience there? Jacob. Right? At Jericho, who had the experience that the children of Israel, they came and there was an open heaven, the walls came down. Hello. So, people of God, the prophets, they knew that for them to receive constant, continuous revelation from God, they need to be in a place where there is an open heaven. All right? They don't simply go and build their dwelling in the place. They built their place in open heavens. Oh, Lord. Now, let's come back to this. And so, hallelujah, verse 4, And he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water, and he cried out and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And so verse 6, so the man of God say, Where did it fall? And he showed him the place. So he cut off a stick, threw it in there, and he made the iron flow. Wow. And therefore he said, Pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand and took it. <sighs> Are you ready? Remember I told you, some time ago, not too long ago, what I've been carrying in my spirit for nine years when I had my encounter with an angel on top of the mountain about end time revival. And I've been carrying that in my womb for nine years, all right? And I told you that these are the end time gifts that God is giving to the body of Christ. What are the gifts again? A flaming torch. One day I'll talk about this again. The flaming torch, the sword. The flaming sword, all right? The, the, the banner, the banner of the Lord, the sickle of harvest, the trumpet heralding the king, all right? And then there is the water pitcher, remember? And then there is what? Battle axe, remember? Battle axe. What is the battle axe for? Matthew chapter 3, verse 10. John the Baptist used the axe spiritually in a spiritual context. He used the axe to cut down the roots of Judaism to prepare the way of the coming Jesus. See, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. What trees is we are we talking here? The trees of Judaism. He was confronting the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Zealots at that time. All right? So he put the axe to the root of the trees and then he said, Every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. He's talking about cutting down the thick forest of religious city in these last days. That's why God is giving us the battle axe. The battle axe is to cut down all those trees that does not bear fruits of relationship with the Holy Spirit. Are you hearing me? It's to cut down the trees of religiousity, the trees that oppose, the trees that resist the movement of the Lord, the trees of humanity, 
of secularism, not humanity, of humanism and secularism, okay? We don't cut down man, we cut down the spirit. Oh Lord, you didn't hear what I say. Thank you, Jesus. And now, let's come back to this. This is the gift, the battle axe. So, 2 Kings chapter 6 again. Look what it says here in verse 5. As one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. And then he cried out, Master, my iron axe head fell into the water. And it was borrowed. The reason why, two things here. The reason why, when he cut the trees, the axe head can fall out, fall off, and fell straight into the Jordan, people of God, is because that axe head was blunt. Blunt, not sharpened. Are you hearing me? Let's take the arrow for example. You have, you have good character. You have the leading of the Holy Spirit. But your arrow head is like this. Blunt. Will it hit the target? It can hit the target, but will it pull down stronghold? Will it be sharp in the heart of the king's enemies? According to Psalms 45, verse 5. Cannot, right? So you need to have what? Sharpen arrowhead, the gifts. Your battle axe needs to be sharpened. If it is not sharpened and you cut trees... <laughs> Of course, the whole axe head will fall off. That's the first thing. Second thing, the reason why it was not sharpened because it was not your own gift. You didn't hear me. It was borrowed. Never borrowed people's gift. God has authentic gifts for you. Never borrow people's anointing. Yes, in the ministry, in the body of Christ, the anointing can bless us, all right? The gift that another brother and another sister can minister to us, they can bless us. But for you to operate in your call, in your gift, in your anointing, God wants you to be an original A long time ago, a long time ago, I was invited to, to speak in the church. can't remember which one now, Lord. So many. <laughs> and I remember very well, I, I put on my white shoes, my white pants, my white shirt, and my white coat. Try to look like Benny Hinn. <laughs> Before I went out from my door of my house, before I left my house at the door, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Go and change your clothes. <laughs> Never try to imitate. A now, people of God, you can learn. We can learn. Nothing wrong with that. We can learn from other ministers. We can learn from other ministries which are good, which are beneficial. We can learn. But don't try to copycat. Don't try to imitate. Be who God called you to be. Be authentic. Because if it is a borrowed gift, you will never steward it well. That's why it's blunt. You hear what I say? If you borrow other people's gift, you are using something from another person, it will never be effective for your life. It will drop off. You cannot cut down the trees effectively. 
Oh Lord, <sighs> we can learn from others, but be who God called you to be. Be who God designed you to be, and you will be sharp in the gifts things of God. You will be sharp. Remember, the anointing, the anointing can increase and can decrease. And the increment and the decrement of the anointing is based on your surrendered life before Jesus. The, oh, you got to hear this. The greater the sacrifice or the surrender, the greater the anointing. It's a price that we paid, all right? So, walk in your own anointing. God wants to anoint the church today. God wants to anoint the body of Christ for kingdom ministries in these last days. And yes, we can rub shoulders, we can be blessed, we can be anointed by other ministers. There's nothing wrong. God wants that for us. But grow in your own anointing. Grow in your own gift. Sharpen your gift. Sharpen your battle axe. Sharpen your arrowheads. And the beautiful thing here is this. Even though that was borrowed, even though that was not his own battle axe, and it fell into the Jordan. And guess what? The man of God took a branch, threw that branch into that river. The battle axe flowed up again. Wow. This was a second time things like this happened. The first time was when they came to this place, the well of Marah called bitterness, bitter water. Moses broke a branch, put that branch into the bitter water. The bitter water became what? Sweet. What does this tell us? What is the branch? Jesus is the branch. The hand of God. Hear this. When something has been made bitter, Jesus can make it sweet again. Amen? When you put Jesus into a situation, He turns it around. Hello? When something that has become bitter can, make, can be made sweet again. Now, even though that gift has sunk into the bottom of the Jordan because it was not stewarded well, Hello, it was not properly sharpened. That thing has somehow drowned in the Jordan. But do not be despair because Jesus can restore that again in your life. When they put that branch, that thing float up, iron head, you know, float up in the water. Hello, nothing is too difficult for God. So some of you may be wondering, <laughs> I have my gift, but it's a blunt. <laughs> it has broken off, fallen off somewhere in Kinta River, whichever river, so I do, or whatever. Hey, hear these people of God. It doesn't matter because with Jesus, He can restore your gift again. With Jesus, He can recompense and reimburse everything that has been stolen from your life. He is the God who restores. I heard the Lord say this. That battle axe for that man was the tool of ministry. That battle axe was everything that he invested in, even though it was not his but this applies to you. It can be your dreams. It can be your desires. It can be your tools of ministry. It can be your talents. Hear this, your skills. You know, talents and skills can be both spiritual and natural. Hello. If you are talented in playing the piano, there's nothing spiritual about it. It's just a natural talent. Are you getting this? Talent can be spiritual and natural, all right? There are, there are gifts that God gives to us in the spirit, gifts that God gives to us in the natural. You are born talented. Some other day you will preach, not now, okay? 
Hallelujah. Oh, Lord. I heard the Lord say this. If you have a talent, a skill, a gift, a dream, a desire that has broken off, that has got disconnected from you and has fallen off into somewhere, sunk deep into some river somewhere, tonight, Jesus is going to make that gift, that talent, that desire float back again to its surface. And you will again be connected to your gift. You will be connected again to your talent, to your skills, to your gifts. And you are going to cut down mighty trees of resistance, of opposition against God's kingdom. You are going to become His battle axe again because this is one of the gifts that God is giving to the body of Christ. I give you glory. Father, even right now, tonight, Lord, we ask of you, whatever that has been lost, whatever that has been drowned in the rivers of despair and hopelessness, today, Father, whatever gifts, whatever, whatever skill that you have bestowed upon your people that has been lost, Today, by the power of the name that's above every other name, Lord, we put that name of Jesus into that river. We put the name of Jesus into that pool of despair and hopelessness and we decree, let it surface right now. Let it come up again. Let the gifts, let the battle acts come up again. Let the gifts of the Holy Ghost arise in you again. Oh, shere karamahanda. Oh, radiadin and ahanda. Second Timothy, and I'll close with this. Second Timothy, and chapter 1, and verse 6, and the Word of God says, Stir up the anointing, stir up the gift that is in you to the laying of hands. And then here again, people of God, remember this. Stir up the gift, stir up the gift. You have the gift that has somehow been drowned in the rivers of despair and hopelessness. Stir it up again. Stir it up again. Stir it up again. It's going to come back again. Oh, and not only that it will come back, it will be restored to you double. What the canker worm has eaten, what the devil has stolen, everything that has been lost, it's, it's going to be restored double and triple in the name of Jesus. Father, connect us again to our gifts, to our battle heads, the axe heads, Lord. The heads of the arrows. Connect us again, Lord, to the gifts of the supernatural. Connect us again, O Lord, because you said in Psalms 145 in verse 11 that we're going to talk about your glory. We're going to talk about your power. We're going to talk about your mighty acts, O Lord. And how can we talk about it unless we first experience it? Make that a testimony for your end time church, O Lord. And bless your children in this. Bless them, Lord to sharpen their gifts. Bless them to steward their gifts. Bless them to grow in their gifts that they will become authentic and original. Bless them, O oh Lord, in the restoration of the gifts and the outpouring of more gifts that you are giving to your body, the church, Bless them in this, Father. We give you praise. We give you glory. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. And amen. And amen. Give him glory. Hallelujah.